Und als nächstes hören wir auf Choppers Politics. I'm not saying I would give him a pass for everything, but I am saying that as an African woman that is passionate about the continent of Africa, I think he could be the greatest prime minister that we've ever had. I'm Christopher Hope, the Telegraph's chief political correspondent. Chopper to my pals, and this is Chopper's Politics. This week, we thought we'd take you away from the empty and deserted streets of Westminster and Whitehall, where not enough civil servants are back at work, and consider the wider world of politics, speaking to guests in Berlin, Washington DC, and London. So we're heading to Berlin to speak to Stephanie Bolzen, London editor of German newspaper Die Welt. That was her at the start of the podcast saying, coming up on Chopper's politics in her native German. And she'll be telling us about what Britain can learn from Germany's handling of the coronavirus crisis and the politicization of mask wearing. Then we're talking to Nimco Ali, the FGM campaigner and author who has plenty to say about why women's bodies are always political and why she doesn't mind copying flack for backing the likes of Boris Johnson and Aaron Banks on Twitter. But our first port of call on our whistle stop tour of the world of politics is Japan. As we record this podcast, International Trade Secretary Liz Truss is holding talks with Japan's Foreign Minister Toshimitsu Motegi today, and there are hopes that they may even sign a trade deal by this weekend. So with me now to discuss the prospects of more trade deals is Shankar Singham, advisor to Ms. Truss, who's dialing in from Washington, D.C. Shankar, good morning. How's the weather? Uh, well, it was lovely yesterday, but unfortunately it's uh, it's a bit overcast today. So it's Okay. Hot. It's similar here. It's steamy and hot in southern England today. The big question is, can a trade deal be done by the weekend with Japan? That'd be quite exciting, wouldn't it, for people who want, to, want Britain to get past this Brexit hurdle and start doing trade deals? It's, it's impossible to sort of tell when the deal will actually close. But what we do know is that it is it is pretty imminent and it's extremely likely, obviously, therefore, that the UK-Japan FTA will be the first of the UK's trade deals that is not just a rollover continuity deal. It will have significant benefits above and beyond the the, the existing EU-Japan free trade agreement, which the Japanese were not terribly pleased about anyway. So they wanted to have a more comprehensive agreement. And I think the parties are going to achieve that. And that's a that's a that's a real accomplishment. And you know, all the naysayers who said it's going to take years and years to do trade deals, I think will be proved wrong and the deal will be will be done very quickly, if not the weekend, certainly in a, in a, I would think in a matter of weeks. Yeah. Now a certain financial newspaper in London, which hasn't been exactly excited about Brexit, is, is reporting today that it's worth just 0.07% of GDP to the UK. Is that right? Is that how limited the scope of this deal will be? Well, first of all, no no one can know the benefit of a trade deal until you actually see what the trade deal does. So I'm not sure how the FT can, can project that forward. But it is also true that the UK's historic modelling of the benefits of trade agreements is extremely flawed. Uh, they use uh, a, a very sort of old fashioned gravity model that uh, that is pretty aggressive about the issue of geographic distance. And, and of course, we know that in international trade today, geographic distance is much, much less significant, particularly for things like services trade. Uh, other distance factors like culture, like, you know, whether you have uh, a common legal system, whether you have access to pooled markets, whether you're reducing, whether the trade agreement reduces behind the border barriers and market distortions, all of these are actually much, much more significant. And the UK's modelling does not currently pick this up. I'm certain that the benefits of a UK-Japan agreement are far, far greater than has been suggested by the FT. And that's partly because what modern trade agreements do is they create bigger pooled markets. So, for example, in financial services, if, for example, we get a, a good deal in financial services with the US, you could be creating a pooled market for financial services that has huge benefits for both the economies, both of the UK and the US and actually the wider world as well. So so we need to um, you know, bear that in mind when we analyse these agreements. Why do you think we've got so far so quickly with Japan? Well, the Japanese were, were very anxious to get this deal done very quickly. Uh, from a Japanese perspective, they wanted to make sure that they took advantage of the need of the UK to have a rollover or continuity agreement with with Japan. 
And the Japanese response to that was actually, we don't really like the EU-Japan agreement. We think it's pretty minimal and we would like to see a much, much more comprehensive, much, much more liberalizing agreement. We think we can get that with you, but we want to do it quickly. So I think the, the credit here, uh, partly, goes to Japan for this. Japan also is is very anxious for the UK, and I'm sure that Minister Motegi will discuss this with uh, Secretary of State Trust uh, today. The, the, the Japanese are very anxious for the UK to join the Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is the 11 countries uh, of which Japan is probably is, is the biggest member, but it in, also includes Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, a bunch of countries. In Gosh, so, so it, it could be a way, a way into that, and that, that's worth trillions. Yeah, well, basically, the, the, the EU28 minus the UK has about the same economic weight as the TPP plus the UK. And if you take the, the TPP plus the US negotiation that we are currently doing, the percentage of global GDP of of UK plus US plus TPP countries. I mean, you're talking about 60% of the global economy. You know, it's, it, this is a major, uh, a major opportunity. I said at the beginning that you're on this new Trade and Agriculture Commission advising Liz Trust, the Trade Secretary. Did you? What, what's your take on the row about standards? Because surely, I mean, like some would say it's more of a labelling issue than anything else. So why can't this UK accept? food standards which are worse or, or seem to be worse or at least different to what's in the UK as long as the food is labelled as such? Yeah, there's a couple of issues here. I mean, first of all, we have to understand the baselines of other countries. There's an awful, awful lot of nonsense and mythology talked about you know, food standards around the world. Uh, there's this assumption that, that, that the US food standards are low and they're, they're, they're really not. In fact, they're some of the highest standards in, in the world. And many countries that we're negotiating trade agreements with have, like New Zealand, for example, have extremely high um, animal welfare standards, while at the same time, we are importing products, particularly things like poultry, from places like Poland and Thailand and Brazil, happily without complaining at all, whether stocking densities for chicken are, are, are far worse than in the US. So I think, you know, we need to get some reality and some clarity into what is actually going on. And then, you know, we also need to understand what's good for UK consumers. The, the, the incidence of Campylobacter and other diseases, uh, foodborne diseases for poultry, is five, almost five times higher in, 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 in Europe than it is in the US. So, you know, it, the, the US may very well say to the UK in a trade negotiation, you need to improve your food hygiene standards. We don't think they're very high. And if you want to get UK lamb and UK beef into our market, you better use pathogen reduction treatments and, and other disinfectant washes to make sure that our citizens in the US are not subject to the same rates of Campylobacter and uh, foodborne diseases that you are. So, so you, you think that as part of the deal that we have British farmers may have to chlorine wash their own chicken to, to export? If they want to get any product into the US, it's going to have to be treated by, by a disinfectant wash because the, the US takes the position, look, diseases are bad. The disinfectant washes kill diseases. We will use disinfectant washes. And the Canadian beef farmers found found this out to their cost. You know, they got a deal with the Europe, Europe with the European Union for beef access, and and then they were basically told by the US that if you don't use um, these disinfectant washes, and by the way, most of them are not chlorine related. Now they're things like paracetic acid and lactic acid and that sort of thing, more like vinegar, frankly, than right. anything else. And, vinegar and wash. So, okay. And so, and so what the US is saying to the Canadians, in fact, there's been a recently, actually, just a couple of days ago, there was a huge beef recall where, where beef from Canada was sent back because it didn't satisfy US food hygiene standards. So, so we, we need to understand what reality is first. There's a lot of nonsense that is being talked about this issue. We had a seat on the WTO, the World Trade Organization, since the beginning of February. Can Liam Fox win? He's, he's in the running to be the head of the WTO, isn't he? There's a vote at some point in September. Yeah, so there's a campaigning process that, that, that is going on right now. And that campaigning process ends uh, September around September 7th or, or something like that. And then, then there's a series of... There's, it, it, this is a decision that is done by consensus 
so there are a series of sort of quasi votes uh, which sort of winnow down the, ca- the candidates down to a final two and then there's a sort of consensus decision but like all WTO decisions it's very important that it seems to be a consensus decision of the whole uh, membership. It's like electing a pope it sounds like. I, I was going to say it's a little bit like a papal <laughs> enclave without the Holy Spirit so 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 uh, <laughs> did, you, did you think it can Liam Fox win despite the claim this week that his email was hacked for a few months last year? Yeah, I, I think I think Liam has a reasonable chance. I, I think the members of the WTO will have to ask themselves, you know, a very serious question, which is when the next, you know, pandemic occurs or, or, or you know, we're already a, a system in crisis. Global trade is declining now. Uh, ex- you know, even even without COVID, global tra- trade was was declining. Global trade as a percentage of global GDP, which is a, which is a key metric has been declining for many, many years, actually. The increase in countries sort of taking their the law into their own hands and regulatory protectionism and so on is massively on the increase. And when we have a, another crisis, the WTO Director General has to sit across the table from Donald Trump or Xi Jinping or Narendra Modi, you know, and they are facing enormous domestic political pressure to to frankly, you know, engage in, in, in wholesale protectionism. Who is the most likely person as WTO Director General to, to credibly make the case for the rules-based system and to bring those world leaders over the line? But regrettably, it's not going to be uh, somebody who has no political heft or somebody from, you know, a developing country. It has to be somebody who has the requisite political heft, the requisite networks, the requisite contacts. And they have to, frankly, come from a serious, you know, G7 and G7 country. So I think when WTO members really ask themselves that question, there's only one candidate that, that satisfies that those rules. The, the, there'll be other arguments, too, for other candidates, but that we won't have them here given t- the time constraints. So so putting aside the issues with, with farming, Shankar Singer, what are the chances, you think, of getting a US trade deal, say, by Christmas? Well, again, as I said before, it's, it's very difficult to project when a deal will actually happen. What needs to happen for the US and the UK, and both sides want this, is, is to manifest uh, significant momentum before the US election. And one manifestation of, of momentum would be what I've characterised as an early harvest set of measures. So the UK is very concerned right now with the the possibility of being caught in retaliatory tariffs for the Boeing Airbus deal. And this affects the Scotch whisky industry and it affects gin and other production in the UK. Uh, August the 12th, Ambassador Lighthizer will make a recommendation about which other products will be caught in the in the retaliatory tariffs trap. And I think, you know, Liz Trust has just been over here in Washington uh, making her case to, to Ambassador Lighthizer about getting the UK out of the scope, out of the zone of US retaliatory tariffs. And I think it's really important as a, as a sort of down payment on the deal that the US takes the UK out of that, out of that scope of retaliatory tariffs because, you know, the UK is no longer a member of the EU. We should not be caught by EU malfeasance. And from a US perspective, you, you use retaliatory tariffs to make sure that the EU complies with the WTO agreement. And attacking UK companies uh, will actually be counterproductive because all it will do is the EU will be delighted that some of the the retaliatory tariff pressure has been applied to UK companies and not to their companies. They'll also be delighted that it erodes the US-UK relationship and erodes support in the UK for the US-UK trade deal. And they will be even more delighted with the Scotch whisky industry being attacked because that disrupts the the Scottish place in 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 the union and the in the UK's internal market and that therefore destabilizes and undermines the UK's trade negotiated position with the EU. So from an American perspective it would be a massive own goal to do this and I think we can easily get some you know good early harvest measures and uh, if we if it's not by the end of the year I think it 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 stands to be shortly after that. Well Shankar Singham thank you so much for joining us today live from Washington DC. Thank you. Great to be with you Chris. Now, in Germany over the weekend, more than 20,000 people gathered to march against the country's coronavirus restrictions. Demonstrators said that wearing face masks violated their freedoms. Some held banners saying that coronavirus was a false alarm. And while the protest was peaceful, few were practicing social distancing. 
And that may come as a surprise to people in the UK, given that Germany has been heralded for its calm handling of the pandemic. So how did Germany get there? And are mass protests against the restrictions of the pandemic where the UK is heading? Stephanie Bolzen, Develt London editor, joins me right now from Berlin to discuss that. Stephanie Bolzen, Develt London editor, good morning or guten Tag. No, guten Morgen. That's guten right. Guten Morgen, yeah, exactly. It's still morning in Berlin, so we can say guten Morgen. Exactly right. Now, you've been studying, uh, you're so well placed for studying how Germany and the UK has dealt with this coronavirus crisis. How would you characterize Germany's approach to dealing with it? I think Germany's approach was rather factual, very much matter of fact. I mean, obviously, at the time um, I was in, in London, so I could only get a sense of what was going on in Germany by talking a lot to my parents, friends, family, following the news. But from the beginning, I think the big difference was that very much most of my my loved ones in Germany did never feel really scared of the virus. They felt that the health system is coping or will cope. They also felt, I think, pretty much they trusted their politicians. Of course, some did not. But in general, there was never a real sense of panic, uh, despite being in the middle of Europe, um, bordering on Austria, not being very far from Italy. So, yeah, it, it, was, uh, it was a shock, of course, but it never felt panicky. I wonder how, where that calmness came from, because, of course, you've got a much more open land border. Uh, and you, as you say, you are open to being infected by countries where it's much worse. I think that the German government, and you must understand, and that's a very, very important difference between uh, Britain and Germany. Um, Germany is a federal country. We have 16 so-called Länder, and they have the competence for health. And um, the competence also goes down to the local level very much. We have 400 so-called Gesundheitsämter. These are the local health authorities who have yeah, massive competences. They decide where they test, how they test, how often they test. They check the um, capacity of hospitals, intense care units, and so on and so forth. And then the spread of the virus in Germany started basically in two places. One was um, an automotive company in Bavaria where a staff member had gone to China, had come back and then infected uh, several colleagues. And the other origin of the spread came from the famous Austrian skiing place in Ischgl. And course, I yes. personally, yeah, I personally know people who were in Ischgl skiing and in <laughs> fact they, they, they brought the virus back. But it was known very quickly. And I think the decisive thing at the time, back in uh, early March, was, or end of February, early March, was that they, um, these people were identified very quickly. They were, well, they, most of them, of course, voluntarily uh, isolated or were told to isolate. And they tested, 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 tested. And they tried to um, follow back rigorously the um, chains of infections. And I think that helped a lot to make sure that the virus would not spread into the, into the community. So the key thing was testing, 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 and this idea of these 16 lander running the show rather than remotely in Berlin. It's run locally by, by, by local health authorities, effectively. Yeah, exactly. I mean, for Angela Merkel, the challenge was, of course, because she doesn't have the competence. She can only recommend what to do. But her challenge was to make sure that you don't have a complete chaos of different rules in different ways. So you have one strict rule, say, in Bavaria and a much more relaxed rule in neighboring Baden-Württemberg or in Saxony. So she was constantly in video conferences with the health ministers or the prime ministers of the different lender. And she tried, and this is what she's really good at, that because she has done that so many times in Brussels, she was the mediator. Um, in general, I would say Angela Merkel was by far the most, most cautious person, yeah. while the lender, looking at economic consequences, wanted to leave the lockdown quicker. She was always the one a little bit wagging her finger saying, oh, oh, oh no, this is too fast and you, you ought to be more careful. I remember around four weeks ago um, in Mecklenburg-Vorpommern, which is uh, in the northeast of Germany, bordering the Baltic Sea, the prime minister suggested that they should now um, stop the uh, compulsory wearing of face masks. And he got immediately um, 
beaten up, so to say, verbally <laughs> by the other prime minister who said, is this far, much too early? It is one of the things that might save the public health. And um, he then retracted and didn't bring it up anymore. There is, there's a very open discussion going on. Yeah. But in the end, they always find a consensus. Turning to the UK, have you seen a difference in the way this these public health messages have been communicated in Germany to the UK? For example, we have the, the Prime Minister flanked by the two top medical and scientific advisors in the UK at those regular press conferences. Uh, has that been a similar, similar way of communicating it all in Germany? No, it's not. I mean, there are occasions where the Chancellor and the Health Minister together um, have done press conferences with the head of the Robert Koch Institute, Lothar Wieler, who's, um, this institute is, so to say, the official health institute advising the government. But usually they are separated. The Robert Koch Institute do their daily or weekly press conferences, and then the chancellor or the um, regional prime ministers will do theirs. And I must say, I don't think it was a good idea to have British prime minister flanked by scientists, because... I think they did not have the independence they should have to say what they think because simply they are standing next to the prime minister. And I th I can only imagine there is pressure and it is difficult to escape the pressure. The political pressure is mixed up with the scientific pressure. I think it would have been better to have them on their own, their own platform and they can say what they like. I think it's because from the beginning they've been saying we've been following the science. So the idea, I think, I can only imagine, I don't know this, the putting them on the same platform has meant that that is literally the politicians following the scientists into the room to explain it all. I mean, literally following the science and they're going not further than that. Of course, that also means that when you get very difficult decisions which are political then it's hard to know where to go because the science says one thing, but politicians want to get the economy moving, for example. Yeah, of course. And then also um, not one scientist says the same than the next scientist. So yes. this is, this is I mean, this is the biggest challenge we are facing because this is a new virus. Everybody is making mistakes. And at the end of the day, you have to make a judgment. But I think mixing up publicly political pressure and political interests and obviously, yeah, the, the interests also of MPs and their constituencies and this all in the very same room in a very very limited space of time, I, I could imagine that has not been helpful at times. Yes, quite. But the record in Germany has been better, hasn't it, with fewer deaths and a lot of cases. So possibly this, this, this test, test, test and a more localised approach has worked and could be a model as we try and approach that maybe what could be the second wave this winter in the UK. Yeah, maybe. I mean, again, already going into the coronavirus crisis, I remember looking up the um, numbers comparing capacities of intense care units. And I, I came across a number of Germany already before the corona pandemic had 25,000 intense care units. And then I looked up the UK and I found yeah. 5,000. 5,000, I, I know. I remember tweeting this. And I got I really, really bad reactions on Twitter uh, by British people saying, stop scaring us. And I was thinking, that's a bit unfair. I'm not scaring. I'm just putting the facts out here. Well, the, the, I think that would be the, the reason the lack of, of ventilated beds will form part of the inquiry when it starts. It's not all been plain sailing in Germany, has I saw at the weekend there's been 20,000 people demonstrating against restrictions. And I, I can only imagine we're a few weeks behind that in the UK. Why are so many demonstrating against against being told to wear masks and they can't see their friends? There is a very intense discussion going on in Germany, of course, if the protection of the whole community or the whole population against the virus is completely exaggerated. Mm. And this comes, interestingly, from all parts of society. Th those people you saw here in Berlin on the weekend, and I think it was far more than 20,000. Uh, some talk about hundreds of thousands. Uh, as ever, you know, it's a political thing, how many people yes. went to a, a protest. Yes. But um, that was a mixture of supporters of the right wing anti-immigrant party Alternative für Deutschland. It was yoga people. It was old people, not so many young people. There were animal protection people. There was animal welfare people. There was It was a weird mixture of people. And you could say, oh, well, these are the weirdos and ignore them. But you can't ignore them. First of all, because, of course, there is a risk of infection if people get together and they obviously did not wear any face masks and they were all very close together. So the risk of spreading is uh, spreading the virus is there. But yeah. there is 
a certain sympathy, which I find in my own environment here, of my own friends and family who are saying, are we doing the right thing? Is it really worth protecting the old people and at the same time risking the economy and risking the health again of so many other people who are now not treated and who do not get the attention they need. And especially when it comes to school, when it comes to workplaces, um, we are looking at massive unemployment and all that. Are we going too far? What I find, uh, I've just come to Germany a week ago, what I find a bit, um, what makes me a little bit nervous, to be honest, is that this debate It's a very healthy debate at times. It's very necessary. You constantly have to talk about it because you also have to question the limitation of our basic rights, whether it's data protection, how we are now, how the, how big the surveillance is in Germany, which has always been a big topic, as you know, because of our Nazi history, because of the GDR history. People are very wary, wary of any state uh, surveillance. But at the same time, This, so to say, accompanied by lots of conspiracy theories. Yes. So there is a lot of stuff out there that actually the virus doesn't exist, that it has been brought into from China. There are many, many growing echo chambers on different channels, especially messenger services. It's, it's interestingly also, if you look at the polls, the anti, the anti uh, immigrant, the right wing party AFD, really plummeted in the poll at the beginning of the coronavirus crisis. And now it's slowly creeping up again. And that has to do with that we are at a point that people feel we need to move on. Is the government overdoing the protection of public health? And how do we, how do we yeah, basically <laughs> protect our democracy, our democratic institutions, and don't get them overrun by people who maybe have other things in mind? Well, Stephanie Bolton, will you come back on the podcast perhaps later this year to tell us how it's going further on? Is that okay with you? Yeah, would love certainly, that. because I will be in London and then probably stuck in my house again. So I will love to talk to you again, Chris. <laughs> well, let me tell you, if we can get the red line open, you'll be one of our first guests there. Stephanie Bolton, Deval London editor, thank you so much for joining us on this week's Chopper's Politics. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Chris. Right, stay with us. Coming up, we'll be talking to campaigner and author Nimco Ali about why she thinks Boris Johnson is one of the best Prime Ministers we've ever had and why Britain's biggest Brexit donor Aaron Banks gets an unfairly bad press right after this. We're interrupting this podcast to bring you news of another Telegraph show we think you might like. It's called Planet Normal. And it's hosted by me, Liam Halligan. And me, Alison Pearson. We're both Telegraph columnists who share the view that far too often those who shout the loudest on the telly just don't represent the views of normal people. So take a trip with us to Planet Normal. We're joined by some stellar guests, well-known voices from politics, business and the arts. All from different fields, but they have one thing in common. They're at the top of their game, but distinctly down to earth. The good news is I finally learned what a podcast is and even how you subscribe to it. It's actually quite simple. Search for Planet Normal on your podcast app or click on the link in the show notes for this episode. You don't really know what a podcast is, do you? I am one. Look, I am one. Who needs to know what it is? I am one. Okay, shut up. <laughs> And we're back. Now, my next guest, Nimco Ali, was just seven years old when she was subjected to FGM, or female genital mutilation, on a family trip to East Africa. Now, she's dedicated her entire adult life to work to put an end to this horrific practice, campaigning for her own charity, Daughters of Eve. She also has some very unexpected views of senior Tories like Boris Johnson and Zach Goldsmith and the woke culture. Now, in our chat, Nimco talks frankly about women's bodies, so you may want to keep that in mind if you listen to this podcast with small children. I started by asking Nimco Ali about her new book, What We're Told Not to Talk About, But We're Going to Anyway. It's a book essentially about the four stages of womanhood, which is periods, orgasms, pregnancies and the menopause and really trying to combat the concept of shame that surrounds each and every one of those experiences. When I first read the blurb of the book, 
I felt a bit uncomfortable about reading it. I thought, I'm looking here into, into what women really think. Is that why men should read it, do you think? No, definitely. Well, that's why men should read it. And also because of the fact that men's egos are what we're trying to protect with all these kind of concepts of shame around women having periods, about pregnancies and menopause, and many of these things are literally on a day-to-day basis killing women. So I think men should read it in order to get over the fact that these are things that they should be uncomfortable about. It doesn't hold back mentioning the C word, does it, Nimco? The see you next Tuesday word. Yeah, the see you next Tuesday word. Uh, yes, exactly. <laughs> but, but why not? It's a word, isn't it? It, it, it? You're just trying to, it's almost like, you know, you're taking ownership back, aren't you? It is a word. So I think, I think both the vagina and the C word are deep and warm places. And I always, for me, actually, I take more offence than when we call shallow or like you know flawed men the c word because i think there's there's a lot of depth and warmth in the female anatomy and that's my kind of comeback to it so i do think because it's like we're all fascinated by the vagina and the female sexual organs but then we're unable to talk about it i think that's why a lot of myths and a lot of things that destroy women's lives come from and from somebody that has gone through one of the most horrific forms of violence against women just for the fact to curb my sexual appetite or my sexual being which is female genitalia mutilation I've always been fascinated by how much people talk about the female anatomy but not necessarily ever say the words or talk about it directly yeah and for me it's I've been very much determined to talk about the vagina and everything that goes in or, or in or out of that place in order for us to feel more comfortable about it you, you do a lot of good campaigning work about FGM female genital mutilation and you discuss your own personal experience in the book which is graphic and shocking how big a problem is it in the UK well, globally, it's 200 million women that have undergone FGM, and that's why I set up the Five Foundation, which is the global partnership to hopefully end FGM by 2030. In the UK, there is about 137,000 women living with the consequences of FGM, and many of those women, like me, were cut outside of the UK. So there is a substantial population of women who have had FGM that are living in the UK. But in terms of risk factor, those risk factors are going down. And that's all thanks to, ironically, a lot of very white, pale men who probably read the Telegraph, who you would never think would talk about the female anatomy. But Theresa May was a huge champion of, of tackling it, wasn't Theresa she? May was incredible. Boris Johnson has been incredible. Zach Goldsmith and Jacob rees even Jacob rees Why does it happen? Why, why, why is it that some cultures feel they have to do it to young girls? Um, it is, honestly, it's just to kind of curb the female kind of voice. So essentially, if you subject a girl to something like FGM, then she's less likely to put her head above the parapet. And I always say that FGM was meant to make me quiet and maybe more like you know follow the rules but it made me one of the loudest people in the room because of the fact that I was just so confused by this horrific act which was meant to initiate me into womanhood and I thought I had no idea what it is to be a woman but I knew it wasn't meant to be painful and asking those questions led me to really finding out that a lot of the realities behind FGM was a lot of very weak men that were scared of women actually having any power. Why do you think uh, women's bodies are political, Nimco? Why is, there a, why is there a fight over women's bodies in, in terms of politics? I don't know why it is. Yeah, because it's it's control. I think one of the key things is that, like land, women's bodies are places where life is created. So, so women are seen as like assets in terms of communities as opposed to as citizens. So just like we fight over land in order to grow or to kind of dig for gold and all those things, I think women have always been seen as property in order to produce a next generation and therefore somebody had to own it as opposed to really allowing women to own their own bodies. And are male politicians the problem here? My daughter, I've got two teenage daughters, one said, said yesterday that women spend more than £5,000 in their lifetimes on tampons. You know, arguably they should be free on the NHS. They're part of, they are what you need to survive as a woman now. Yeah, they definitely should be free. And I think we shouldn't necessarily be looking at tampons, but we should be looking at things like the moon cups and things which are less impactful on our health. Well, one of the things that I talk about in the book is that anything that relates to both men and women is described as painful in, t- in terms of like toothaches, headaches, but then something like period pains or pregnancies, like, you know, defined as uncomfortable. And as a woman, I can tell you who's had both headaches and period pains, period pains can be extremely uncomfortable and really painful. So I 
and I don't necessarily think a lot of men do this intentionally, but it's just because of the fact that we don't necessarily think about other people apart from ourselves when we're around the table. That's why diversity, whether it's in gender or race, is always important or even disability. But it's just the fact that men just don't think about things like periods because they're not seen as normal things. So if we were talking about periods on a day-to-day basis, then men would know that 51% of the world's population do have periods. And then and they'd also understand that condoms are not, are not the only form of contraception. So there are many things that are skewed on the point of like, you know, looking after men than they are looking after women. Yeah, there's been lots of lots of talk recently about um giving out free masks for everybody on the NHS. And I guess that's caused some hollow laughter given the fact that women must pay for tampons. You mentioned earlier there that you've had almost stuffy white men, as much as as women, um, have helped you tackle FGM in this country. But Boris Johnson, maybe Zach Goldsmith. People have been surprised by that, but, but, but you're not. Um, no, I'm not. Actually, there's a really interesting photo um, that a lot of people talk about, the, the Bullingdon Club, where you've got, like, you know, David Cameron, Boris Johnson, George Osborne. And oh, yeah. that was literally taken, I think, a year and a half before I had my FGM. And I, and if you'd said to me, like, you know, that 30 years on, that those, some of those men would be the ones that are leading the conversation around FGM who have actually helped in order to get investments and real legislation change, it would be like, what are you talking about? But I think it's one of those things where FGM is so far removed from the their lived experience that they only see it from a human rights perspective so for me talking to them about something that happened to me as a child and for them to relate I think that's been incredible and it was really interesting at the beginning I was trying to access spaces where the violence against women and girls sector where a lot of that was held by white working class women and we were trying to talk about like you know how FGM was violence against women and girls and they really wanted to see it as a cultural issue and these men just were rightfully were like well, yeah, this is horrific. Let's just stop it. Like, what, what, what do you need me to do? And sometimes maybe I think it's because they also had a traumatic childhood going to boarding school. Like, you know, going to boarding school at the, at the age of seven or 11 and having to be away from your family and having to have that stiff upper lip and really not be able to talk about your feelings is not dissimilar to the experiences that I had about FGM, which was very alien to a wider community that I was in, but then also not so alien to another community that I was in. You, you talk up for Boris Johnson, don't you, on Twitter, which isn't always easy. Uh, particularly, I think maybe maybe for you with your background, you, you cop some flack for the PM, don't you? No, I, it wasn't. It was more the fact that I knew that Boris Johnson would make an incredible prime minister because he is somebody that really cares and does really listen. And having met him when he was at the Foreign Office as well, talking about like you know girls' rights and girls' education, he's somebody that has always listened. And I. And for me, I always talk about experiences and people that I've met. And I knew that he'd be a great prime minister. And I wanted him to be given the opportunity to be a prime minister um, and to, um, to be prime minister. And I stood up for that. And yes, I did get a lot of flack, but I think I've been proven right. And I think history will will show what a compassionate human being he is. But for me, I think it's like as the UK takes over the G7 next year, I think that's where the prime minister and his commitment to gender equality and his, and his commitment to specifically women on the continent of Africa who are passionate about will really come through. A man that cares about adolescent girls, a man that cares about environment and a man that cares about the wildlife in the world is somebody that can do no wrong in a sense. I'm not saying I would give him a pass for everything, but I am saying that as a, as an African woman that is passionate about the continent of Africa, I think he could be the greatest prime minister that we've ever had in that sense. Right. Gosh, that's a big thing to say. I suppose post-Brexit, if we do finally free ourselves from the shackles of the European Union at the end of this year, because we're currently in this transition period, the Commonwealth could be, uh, and there are many African countries which are in the Commonwealth, could be, could be one of the key areas where we can focus in the future. No, definitely. I think having a conversation around trade and really uplifting Africa and really, for me, I've seen over the last two decades that China has had a massive um, impact on, like, you know, on, re- on really enhancing and entrenching poverty and gender inequality in Africa. And I think the United Kingdom as a G7 and as the head of the Commonwealth can really offset that. And that's something that I'm incredibly um, passionate about. There's someone else you're quite, you have been supporting and, and said as a friend of yours is Aaron Banks, who's also a bit of a stick to beat the country about Brexit with, isn't he? What is it about Mr Banks? Do you think that people are uncomfortable in this country, maybe on the left, about white people sticking up for pride in their country yeah I think do you know what the thing is it's a little bit of snobbery I think as well in that in, in, in the sense that it's the whole point of a lot of people who are 
very, I was like, you know, I voted Remain. I was at those dinner parties. I assumed that nobody in this country would vote Leave. And I think it was that ego that we had that we got pushed back from, like the fact that people in, in this country were bored of the EU. They wanted um, to have their, they, they wanted to determine their own, like, you know, trade deals and so on. And someone like Aaron Banks speaks for the majority of, of this country. So I think he's an incredibly kind person and, and, and he hasn't got the, um, what is the word I'm looking for? He doesn't actually have the same ego as many people who are um, not necessarily just on the left, but many of those Remainers who are still like, you know, throwing their toys out of the pram. And just, just finally, what do you make of the um, transgender campaigners and their debate over the nature of being a woman? And do you think that is advancing any any causes or is it is it, being, is it a problem in advancing gender rights? I think we have to. So one of the key things is that I really want to reach out, reach out to trans women and have a conversation to see that actually if these very loud and sometimes offensive statements that are being made are actually coming from the community or just things that are being said. So a few weeks ago, um, Action Aid, which is predominantly, like, you know, exclusively for women in poverty, stricken countries said that they were no longer define a woman by their by the biology and it's like it's a I'm not going to call it a privilege but it's a conversation that millions of women do not have so the idea the fact that I could say in 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 sub-saharan Africa right now well I don't identify as a woman so therefore you can't subject me to FGM it's just like you know it's just nonsensical so I do believe that trans women are women but I think the way that things are happening at the moment is really not helpful and I do think that there are things that um, women need so access to contraception access to protection and access to legal protection so the idea like you know having a vagina having ovaries having a period those are things which are specifically key to women and if we write away those and if we write away those things or write out those things then that is actually going to be a horrific thing that's going to happen to women across the world so I do think that the way that things are happening at the moment is 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 not helpful to achieving gender equality and it's quite shocking that I think when a lot of people transition from being for from being male to male to female they get shocked at how rubbish women are treated but the reality is some of us have lived with that all our lives so i hope i wish i wish actually that a lot of trans women would kind of stand with us and support us and not like you know go up people like um jk R. rowling who have been brave to say the things that they say and things that i agree with but i'll probably get a lot of um flack for this as well because i'll, I'll probably be called transphobic even though i'm not well, Nim Karali, a fascinating conversation. And thank you so much for joining us on Chopper's Politics. And we'll put a link to Nimco's new book in the show notes for this episode. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, that's all for this week. I hope you enjoyed our round the world trip on this sunny day. If you did, tell us. If you leave a five star rating and even a short review on Apple Podcasts, it helps us in the podcast charts and really helps other people find this show. Thank you to my guests this week, Shankar Singham, Stephanie Bolson, and of course, Nimco Ali. Thanks to my producers, Louisa Wells and Elliot Lampitt, and my editor, Theo Leludis. As I said earlier, you can find links to Nimco Ali's new book, What We're Told Not To Talk About, But We're Going To Anyway, on the show notes this episode. If this podcast left you curious for more top-notch Telegraph journalism, go to telegraph.co.uk forward slash chopper, where you can get 30 days free access to all of our best coverage completely free of charge. And please do get in touch by emailing me, chopperspolitics at telegraph.co.uk, or find me on Twitter at chopperspolitics. And always, always buy your copy of the Daily Telegraph. Until next time, cheerio! Cheerio!